If you're like me and live in an area where there's always the threat of a thunderstorm or lightning, then more than likely you're going to have a surge protector installed on your home, or at a minimum you're going to have a surge protection power strip like you see here to protect your TV as well as other expensive electronic devices. There are many videos on YouTube showing how to install these. It's very simple to install them. I will bring it up in this video, but very few videos explain exactly how these work. Let's get started. If you take a closer look at a power strip, if you opened one up, or in this case, you can see this one here is filled with a potting material. Inside here, there are components. The purpose of those components is to limit transients or variations in voltage on the AC line. You want to keep the AC voltage as stable as possible, and of course if there's a lightning strike, the voltage of the AC line could spike up momentarily. So the job of this device is to suppress those spikes, keep everything nice and smooth, so you don't damage the devices in your home. Now if you take a look right over here on the right, you're going to see a utility pole. And right where that arrow is pointing is another surge arrestor. The utility companies have one outside, but they don't always protect you 100%. And that's why you want to have one of these on your house or a power strip version for your computers or televisions. Now in the event of a lightning strike at the utility pole, say it hits one of the primary lines, which could be 7620 or up to 15,000 volts in a residential area, you don't want to have that voltage spike way up because the voltage that goes into the transformer has an effect on the voltage going out. So the input voltage on the primary side, if it went from 7620 up to thousands of volts higher, you're going to see way higher on the secondary side instead of seeing each leg of the transformer at 120 volts, it could spike way up into the hundreds, and you don't want that to happen. So that device is designed to take the excess voltage from that lightning strike and direct it to ground. Once it goes to ground, it bleeds off that excess voltage, keeping the voltage at a stable level going into the transformer. The surge protector that's used outdoors for the utility pole with the transformer is basically the same idea as the one you see here, as well as a power strip, it's just much heavier duty. If you were to open this up and chip away all that black potting that's inside, or even open up a power strip, inside you would find a component like you see right here, very similar. And this is called an MOV, which is a metal oxide varistor. Looking closely, you can see what appears to be a disc inside. One lead is connecting to this side, and the opposite side is the exact same way. The number on this one says 150L20B. Now each one of these is designed for a specific operating voltage and it's also designed to do its job at a specific voltage which I'm going to show you momentarily. Just to show you there are variations, here's another one that's designed for higher voltage but it's a smaller diameter designed to handle less energy. MOVs, also known as voltage-dependent resistors, are typically made out of zinc oxide as well as other metal oxides pressed into a ceramic material. Depending on what you're going to be using it for, AC or DC circuits, how much the voltage is going to be, you would have to refer to the product data sheet for these type of components to make sure you choose the right one for the job. The 150 refers to 150 volts AC continuous voltage. If you're going to be using this with DC, it's rated 200. How much energy or joules the device can handle is directly related to the size. So this one here, you can see is about 20 millimeters in diameter. That's what the 20B means. If you have the same thing and it's thicker, so the same 20 millimeters and thicker, it's going to be able to handle more energy in the event of a lightning strike. And what many people do, as well as the companies, they will place multiple ones of these in parallel so the surge protector can handle a lot more energy. Keep in mind, these are typically designed for short duration use, 10 to 30 milliseconds, which makes them ideal for lightning protection. 
These MOVs are also incorporated into many electronic devices such as television sets. So if you ever opened one up, you would see some of these on the power input board placed right across the power input to give you a little bit of protection in the event of a variation in voltage for the device. When the proper component is chosen, these MOVs do a very good job of protecting your home as well as electronic devices. And the best part, they're fairly inexpensive. Now I'm going to give you a few different demonstrations and it's going to make you understand very easily how this works. So right here we have 150 volts AC maximum voltage rating like I told you a minute ago. And if it's going to be used with DC, it is 200. So there's other ratings tied to MOVs. The continuous voltage rating is up to 150. And that means as long as you're using up to 150 volts and you do not exceed that, there's going to be no connection between this terminal here and this terminal here. Basically, you have an open circuit right here. Now, in the event of a lightning strike, what's going to happen, you're going to see the AC line voltage, which is typically between 115 and 125, it's going to spike up. It's all going to happen very quickly, but when it starts to climb and exceed the 150 volt maximum voltage rating for this MOV, this connection here, this leg, and this leg are slowly going to start to connect. And by doing that, it's going to allow the excess voltage to be bled off because it's going to be going through the device and to ground, or in this case, it might be going between the hot wire and the neutral. It's just going to shunt that power and protect your device from getting too much voltage, which can damage it. For this particular MOV, it has a varistor voltage, that's the point where the current starts to flow, that's a minimum of 212 volts DC and a maximum of 243 volts. There's also another term that's used and that's referred to as clamping voltage and when it clamps that's the maximum amount of current that's going to be flowing through this device and the voltage is generally much higher. In this case for this component it's going to be around 360 volts. Over here you can see the meter is set for a mega ohm range. And just to show you that there's no continuity in any way between these two pins, I'm going to connect it up right here. And as you can see, there's no change on the meter here, indicating basically an open circuit for this component. Now to demonstrate how the MOV operates so you can actually see it really clearly, I'm going to be taking this insulation tester made by Hitachi. It has two different voltage outputs. One is 250 and the other is 500. There's a little selector switch right here. The voltage outputs are actually closer to 300 and 600. Before I connect up the component, I'm going to hold it right here. I'm going to turn this clockwise. Alright, that's the 250 volt setting, so it's maxing out just under 300. Switch this lever to the right, and now it should be double that. And you can see we just hit 600. Important because we're going to be using the low and high voltage for this test. Let me put it back to 250. So you have this clamp right over here. That's coming off of the insulation tester connects to one side of the MOV. We're going to take the red probe here and it's going to be measuring voltage of the MOV on the display over here. The other side of the MOV wraps around through this wire and it goes to a 270 K ohm resistor. The purpose of that is to limit the current. That's going to give us around 1 milliamp of current, which happens to match the data sheets for testing. The black lead of this DMM is connected to the opposite side of the MOV. 
and it's over here just to keep it away from all this clutter but it is connected basically across the MOV to give you the voltage reading. Now the current is a different story. We're going to be measuring it over here. That's the milliamp range. So we're going to be reading very close to one or just below. And the way I connected that, the wires come around to here. Negative from the insulation tester goes to the meter. And then the positive for this tester for the current goes to that resistor. Keep these apart and the test should be just fine. What you're going to do is you're going to keep a very close eye on the voltage rating as well as the current. You want to see at which point that this starts to show a current reading. Point one would mean that the MOV is just starting to conduct and that's what would be used to bleed off that excess voltage in the event of a lightning strike. As mentioned earlier, according to the data sheet, it has the varista voltage down between 210 and 240. Slowly get this going. Already at 100 volts turning at this low. Right there, so 120, that's house voltage, and you can see there's no current flowing. 125, 135, let's go for 150. Still no current flowing. Let's go up to 200. Nothing at 2. According to the data sheet, between 212 and 240, it should start to conduct. There it goes, point one at 215. As I go higher, it's conducting at the lower voltage, and we're leveling off around 221. That's using the 250 volt setting, which is 290. So we really need to go much higher in voltage. Let's push this to 500, which is 600. And now let's do it again, and this should go much higher in the current and we'll have a very good idea over here at the Varista voltage. Right now it's conducting. See it's conducting more current, increasing. So that's 233 volts. So the Varista voltage for this one is coming in right around 235. And over here we peaked out around 0.7 milliamps. The test papers say you should be around 1. Now let's try the other component just to see how it changes the voltage. Let me unclip. Let's put this on a lower setting. Now you can see the difference. This one is letting the voltage climb much higher and there's no current flowing. So it's clearly designed for a higher voltage level. Now let's push this up to the 5600 level. Repeat. And then we're going to see when the current starts here and that'll give us an idea of the Varista voltage for this one. There it is. All right, let's go up higher. Four hundred and thirty range. No, wait, four thirty-five. Four thirty-five area. And you can see the current getting a little bit higher. All right, so this one has a Varista voltage of around 470. And when I looked at the data sheet, it was right in that range. So pretty good. The current level that you saw here would be a little bit higher. What's happening, the meter is actually weighing down 
this very low current output generator. So if this was not in place, the 0.6 or 7 you saw before would actually be very close to the 1 or 1. And then the 2 or 3 you just saw a minute ago, 0.2 or 0.3 for this one, would more than likely be around 0.5. But it did give you the ability to see exactly when it started to conduct and at what voltage. Now back to the whole house surge protection unit. I'm going to explain very quickly how it's installed. It's very simple. The most important thing when you install your whole house surge protector is you want to make sure the wires are cut to the shortest length possible and you also want to have them as straight as possible. You're going to take the two black wires as well as the white wire. You're going to strip off the insulation on the ends, 12 millimeter, half inch, just remove that. The first option, you're going to have your main breaker off to make it safe to work in your panel. Hopefully you have an extra space in your panel where you can install a double pole breaker. A double pole breaker covers two bus bars in your panel. So in your panel you're going to have a bar that runs all the way down through the breakers to here. All right? And there's going to be another one here. And it goes all the way down. Each one of these is 120 volts. If you take a voltage reading between the two, it's going to give you around 240 volts. So this breaker that you have must be a double pole. That means it's making contact with each one of those bus bars. Once you pop the breaker in, you're very simply going to take the stripped ends of the wire, secure one black wire to one screw of the breaker, the other black wire to the other screw of the breaker, and then you're going to take the white wire, which is neutral, and connected to the neutral bar. You're going to see all the other wires from the breakers that are white going to the same location and that's where you want to secure the white wire. Now if you don't have a double pole breaker you can also use two single pole breakers but it's extremely important that both single pole breakers are not on the same bus bar. So make sure that one is clipping in to this bar and the other one is clipping into the opposite bar. Then you can do exactly as shown. If you choose not to use a circuit breaker, it's designed to also be directly connected to those bus bars. The ones that I showed you a minute ago that go all the way through behind the breakers, two bars. So you would turn off the main breaker and you would remove the nut that goes on top of the bolt that secures the breaker to the bus bar. You can see it better over here. There's one there. That's one bus bar and over here is another. You would remove that nut and on the end of the wire you would have to crimp on a ring connector or a terminal end like you see right over here. Place it over the bolt, put the nut back on and tighten down securely. Do one at a time Remember to keep the wires as short as possible. Do not allow these routed wires to be really up against any other wires. Take the white wire, go to the neutral bar. Keep in mind when you do it this way, there is no fuse on these wires. They are kind of small, they're like number 12. But the thing to remember is that a surge happens very quickly in a short period of time with a lot of current. So the wires can handle that and very, very rare do these go short. If it ever did go short, a catastrophic failure could be, these wires would more than likely just vaporize. And in that case, you wanna make sure that when you install it this way with a direct connection, keep the wires going to the surge protector down and away from all your other wires. And that is it. Now you know exactly how these work. You just don't say, yeah, I have a surge protector you can actually understand now how the components inside these devices protect your house and electronics. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to rate, thumbs up, and share. Thanks for watching.